T. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. So today is a really fun topic. One that I've been meaning to get to for quite some time now. Uh, it was first brought to me, I think about a week ago or so, roughly, when we were really starting to get excited about free agency. I think it might have been day two of the tampering period after we were about 12 guys in or whatever the case was, 13 uh, free agent signings. And somebody said that um, Kevin Sheehan had tried to rain on the parade of what was going on and likened it to the 2020 class. Said we had seen this before um, and it wasn't that much different than the 2020 class. And I begged to differ. Now, I didn't listen to that interview or that um, uh, podcast uh, episode. Um, and I haven't listened, as I've said, to the Kevin Sheehan Show podcast in over two years. And it sucks because I really enjoyed it. I fell behind and then I just stopped listening. And I'm weird in the sense that I like to kind of keep abreast of what's going on. And I like to listen in order. And um, once I fell behind, I just stopped listening. But um, a lot of times I agree with Kevin. I, I don't always agree with him uh, throughout the years, I should say. And um, when I didn't agree with him, it would be on situations like this, where he'd kind of be ho hummish. And I get it. You know, when you've seen it all, uh, all and, and as a fan, he's seen it all. He's seen the highs. He's seen the lowest of lows. He's seen the highest of highs. He knows what it's supposed to look like. And, and so he's somewhat jaded now. A lot of things don't move him the way that it used to. Um, and so I get it. But. I'm not going to just sit here and act as if the 2020 class of free agents is equal to or greater than the 2024 class that we just signed. Now, I will say there are two factors that you must heavily weigh into this discussion, whether you like it or not. One is we already know what the outcome of the 2020 class was. Okay, we watched that. We lived through it. We know what those guys did or didn't do. And so we have that information. We do not have that information with this uh, class that we just finished signing, right? We don't know how well they're going to play or not play. We can only project. We can only look at it on paper and hope that we get a lot of the production or better than what the, uh, the teams previous to us got from these players. But in a lot of these cases, if we just get the production that the past teams have gotten from these players, um, in their best seasons, et cetera, et cetera, then we're going to be in pretty good shape. But we've said that before. I remember saying this so many times. If we just get the defense that we got the year before, if I, I said that last year about the defense, we'll be fine. And we, of course, we didn't. We were one of the worst defenses in the league last year. I said that about Carson Wentz two years ago. If we just get the 2021 Carson Wentz to show up in 2022, we'll be fine. Of course, the 2021 Indianapolis Colts Carson Wentz didn't show up. So again. I don't want to just assume that these guys are going to play uh, as well, if not better, than they did in their last stop. That said, um, on paper, it's a much better class. And then the second thing is, and I just mentioned it, these guys haven't played yet. So we don't know what they're ultimately going to be. Uh, we can only project. So um, these are things that you have to keep in mind. We're really excited and you don't want to hear anything negative, but... Uh, the facts are what they are, right? But I'm also telling you that on paper, which is what we're going off of, which is what Kevin Sheehan was probably going off of, <clears throat> the money from a monetary standpoint, right? Monetarily, we didn't spend a ton of money, so it kind of feels sort of like 2020 in that there weren't any big time, you know, expenditures, but that doesn't make a, a free agent class. Just because you spend a lot of money doesn't mean you're going to get your money's worth. We paid Albert Haynesworth $100 million, and he might be the biggest free agent bust in NFL history. If he's not at the top of that list, he's very close to the top of that list. So just because you spend money, and, and as Redskins fans of yesteryear, we know when Daniel Snyder first got here, just because you spend money doesn't mean you're going to get the results that that money says that you should get. So I, I don't really subscribe to the theory of spending big to get great results. Spend efficiently, all right? Spend wisely, 
Understand what you're getting. Understand what you're looking for. And I will say this as well. Both of these situations are similar from this standpoint. 2020 was a rebuild with a brand new staff and, and really a changing of the guard from the Jay Gruden, Bruce Allen era into the coach-centric Ronald Rivera approach. There was one holdover here when he got here. Um, what was his name? Uh, I, for, I always forget his name, but they, um, he was like a pseudo GM when uh, Ronald got here, but he was more of like a player personnel type. But he was still here and he kind of helped Ronald with the free agency class in the draft. And then Ronald fired him the next year and brought in a bunch of his cronies. And then things kind of really went downhill from there. But um, this is very similar to that. When you're, when you're turning over a roster, when you're getting the guys in that you feel like can help you implement the things that you want to do, um, this is what it looks like. So a lot of what they did in 2020 looks a lot like what happened here in 2024. But again, I don't think the quality, the quantity is, is pretty similar. The quality, I don't think, is even remotely close. And with that in mind, I want to um, compare and contrast the 2020 free agency class of the Washington Redskins, then turned Washington football team. But at that time, they were the Washington Redskins when free agency took place. They didn't become the Washington football team until July of that year, if you recall. So they were the Redskins at that time, comparing them to the 2024 Washington Commanders free agency class thus far. And we're not done yet. There could be more names added to this list. But as of today, as of the shooting of this video, this is what it looks like. So let's take a look as we compare and contrast the two years. So let's start with the 2020 Redskins free agency um, class and look at what Washington did that year. And then, um, and, and look, don't misremember, okay, what these guys provided for us. All right. Some of these guys played really well. And sometimes the mistake that you make is when you sign a guy to a one-year deal, he plays really well. You go back to that well once again, and that's when the water runs dry, essentially. Like, we got what we got out of Ronald Darby, and then we let him leave, and it was the best thing for us to do. You know, he went to Denver and went back to being Ronald Darby in terms of getting hurt, right? But when he's healthy, he's a damn good corner. So, again, keep those types of things in mind. I, you know, with the class that we're dealing with now, I hope that we are very cognizant of that. But so in 2020, Wes Schweitzer was signed, um, you know, center guard combo from the Atlanta Falcons, three years, like $13 million or whatever it was. And, and that turned out to be a good signing. And I have six guys out of this group of 2020 Redskins that were signed that um, ultimately were successful, you know, played well for us at least for a year. And um, you felt good about the contract that they ultimately signed in 2020. He was one of those players. Um, Kendall Fuller obviously was the guy that we spent the most on that free agency period. It was a four-year, $40 million deal. He played the entirety of his four-year, $40 million deal. And it was a good deal. Um, and he earned every single cent of it. And I wish him nothing but the best in Miami. And he, by far and away, he was the best of all these players that they signed in uh, free agency in 2020. And for some of you saying that means this class sucked if Kendall Fuller was the best of the uh, the guys that they signed. I vehemently disagree. You know, I think that Kendall Fuller is a lot better than people give him credit for. And um, uh, he was really good for us throughout the, the course of that contract that started in 2020. Logan Thomas um, was a guy looking to kind of carve out a niche for himself as a starting tight end, we gave him the opportunity here in Washington, and um, he took advantage of it that first year. Remember, he set career highs across the board. I wasn't in love with him at any point during his tenure here, but I learned to um, like Logan Thomas as a football player, but I always felt like we could do better. I, I mean, You could go back to my 2020 videos, even when he was playing well, I always had complaints, but at the end of the day, he was who he was. And um, there was something about Logan that appealed to me. One, his leadership qualities. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind. And you always knew you were going to get thoughtful, eloquent, uh, eloquently put 
uh, words from him, whether you wanted to hear them or not. And so I respected that about him. And I also respected the fact that he was a guy that um, when he was out there, he was going to give you everything he got, he had, even if it wasn't um, ideal in terms of athleticism, things of that nature. But um, he ended up being a pretty positive signing, even though really that one year, the first year in 2020 was his best year. Who are we kidding? Um, he never really lived up to that after that 2020 year injuries and um, lack of usage, you know, whatever the case may be. He just never got back to the heights of 2020, but he was a solid acquisition um, on this list. Safety Sean Davis. I remember this like it was yesterday. We got all excited about Sean Davis coming over from the Pittsburgh Steelers. And oh my God, you know, this is what happens when you suck. I'm just going to keep it a buck with you. This is what happens when you suck ass. You start attaching yourself to players and you get so excited about guys who hadn't done anything really in the league. I think some fans of the team were thinking about him from his Maryland days. And so they were excited to see him here. But if we're just going off of what he was as a pro before he got here, there was no reason to be excited about Sean Davis. He didn't even make the team. He sucked ass. But we got excited when we signed him because that's where we were. We were a 3-13 and team the year before. We sucked. We were one of the worst teams. We had the second pick in the draft. And so anybody coming here was going to get us excited. Um, Ky- uh, quarterback Kyle Allen. Another guy that Ronald brought over from Carolina. Um, it's not uncommon to see that happen. Obviously, we saw uh, you know Washington in the 2024 free agency class, and we'll talk about that here in a second, bring over some Cowboys with Dan Quinn. So it's not uncommon to see that happen. Kyle Allen was one of the guys that Ronald Rivera trusted, so he brought him along. And uh, also, it always is a lot easier as an offensive coordinator, and Scott Turner came with Ronald Rivera, to implement your offense when you have a, a veteran backup quarterback who knows the system that can help teach it to the others. So um, it always makes a lot of sense when you see a quarterback like Kyle Allen or someone coming from that previous system uh, coming along with the coordinator. It's just easier to implement the offense that way. Thomas Davis, linebacker, literally was on his um, NFL career deathbed when he got here. Literally, he was here for moral support, here to help implement culture he couldn't play anymore. He couldn't run. He couldn't move. This was his last stop. This was literally a paycheck for him. He was a paid babysitter in the locker room and a rah-rah guy. There was nothing here that he could provide for us on the field. <clears throat> we literally donated to the Thomas Davis Fund at the end of his career. Um, J.D. McKissick, running back. I remember telling you guys, and I was very adamant that you're going to love this guy. And it's the same way I feel about Michael Davis, right? But, you know, obviously different positions. But I was adamant that you would love J.D. McKissick. A lot of you, you know, weren't familiar with his game, didn't know what he brought to the table. I said, this is a guy that could be a Swiss Army Knights for us. I thought they'd use him more as a pass catcher down the field because he was a wide receiver coming out of college. And, And the Seattle Seahawks converted him to running back. So... I thought that, much like we thought with Antonio Gibson, they'd use him more of a receiver, split him out, let him run down the field. We saw J.D. McKissick have some success in certain instances, including that Giants game, Taylor Heineke's first start, I believe, in that 2021 season um, after Ryan Fitzpatrick got hurt on that Thursday night against the Giants where he hit him with that uh, rail route up the uh, sideline. JD, I thought, could do more of that kind of stuff, but we never really, you know, utilized him in that fashion. Just a lot of stuff down around the line of scrimmage. Um, But he ended up being a really good football player for us. He's one of the six guys that I pegged as a successful signing from this 2020 uh, free agency class for the Commanders or for the Redskins. Uh, Peyton Barber, you guys know how I felt about Peyton Barber. When we first got him, I, I didn't love it. Right. I was like, OK, I don't think he's going to make the team, yada, yada, yada. I just thought he was a, a a roster filler at the time. He ultimately made the team. And, and, you know, I started to change my tune when I realized that Ron had a very strong affinity for Peyton Barber and a, and a big time respect for him, watching him all those years in the NFC 
South up close and personal when he was a member of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and, and Ronald was coaching the Carolina Panthers. So um, something told me he would make the team. He did. And he might have turned in one of the greatest single yardage short uh, uh, seasons that we've seen in Washington in quite some time. Every fourth and one, every third and one, every you know third and short, every fourth and short, he got it just about. I think it was one two-point conversion he did not get. That was it. But we probably gave it to him 19 to 23 times in that season in those short yardage situations. And he came up clutch every single time it felt like. Um, Cornelius Lucas, uh, we're still talking about trying to get him back now. As fans, I don't think he's coming back. Clearly, they don't want him back if they did. They would have brought him back already, but um, he proved to be one of the more reliable swing tackles in the NFL during this period that he was here. He signed a uh, two-year deal, initially came back, signed another two-year deal, and um, I-, I think we were better off because of it. He was really reliable um, throughout his four years here in Washington. Tight end Richard Rodgers um, was an epic fail. Wasn't expecting a ton from him, but I did expect him to at least make the team. He did not even do that. And it, it was kind of hard to to stomach because I'm like, your dad is on the staff, bro. How do you not make the team and your dad is on the staff? But he wasn't any good. That's why he didn't make the team. And then what was ironic was that we cut him. He goes and plays for the Eagles that year and actually plays well, you know. Um, but that's nor here nor there. He didn't make the team. Neither did wide receiver Cody Latimer. And we, another one of these guys, similar to Sean Davis, <clears throat> excuse me, that we hyped up, made him a lot better than what he was in our heads because we wanted a guy. He sucked ass. And then he got in trouble off the field and he never played a snap here for us, really. Um, he had some crazy incident off the field, which was just weird. And um, he wasn't any good, though. So it didn't even matter. He wasn't very good at football. Linebacker Kevin Pierre Lewis, old KPL, right? And, and, you know, the thing that used to frustrate us with Kevin Pierre Lewis is he was super talented, tons of athleticism, and boy, did Jack Del Rio hype this guy up, and did we get nothing out of him, really? You know, I, look, that was their specialty hyping up guys at the linebacker position that weren't worth a damn. But you, you, we didn't play at the position, and we don't know. So, of course, we didn't know what we were talking about. They, they did it every year. They would go get some bum, hype him up, tell us that we don't know what we're talking about as we watch the guy suck ass on the field and, and try to belittle and demean us because we didn't play the position, right? They did it with Kevin Pierre-Lewis. He did it with Cody Barton. That's what they did. That was their move. The only guy that they didn't show any grace to was Jamin Davis. Maybe because he was the first round pick and they expected more out of him. But that was their move. Go get a bum. Try to sell him to us that he's doing a great job when we can all see with our eyes that the guy's not. And then there's Ronald Darby, who was fantastic in his lone year here in Washington, was outstanding at the cornerback position, really after Kendall Fuller, he was the best free agent cornerback we've signed here in Washington in the last probably decade, to be honest with you. If you go back, that includes Josh Norman. Norman never had a season like Ronald Darby's. Even though Norman created turnovers that first year we got him, um, he got cooked in that season too, if you recall, in 2016, <clears throat> which is when we got him. Um he gave us some big plays. He made some plays, but he gave up a lot of big plays. Ronald Darby didn't give up shit in that year. Nothing. Nobody got behind him. He didn't pick anything off, but nobody got behind him. He, he probably had the most PBUs on the team. He might have been, you know, somewhere near the top of the league in PBUs because he broke every damn thing up. He was outstanding. And we all wanted him back. And when we saw the money he got from Denver, we were pissed off because we said we could have done that. Well, he got hurt as soon as he got to Denver. Played pretty like four or five games, and then he went back to being the Ronald Darby that couldn't stay healthy, which is why we ended up getting him on the one-year, $4 million deal that we got him for. But that's no here nor there. He was excellent for us. And so um, we're ho- I'm hoping Michael Davis does the same thing because 
I said this on Rio show and I said this in the comment section responding to someone that I think that Michael Davis is Ronald Darby from 2020. You know, the different the biggest difference is Darby was still relatively young when we signed him that year and Davis is a, a bit older. He's similar in age to Kendall Fuller. Uh now, you know, 28, 29 somewhere in that neighborhood, but he can still run. You don't lose your speed. That's one of the last things to go. When you're when you're flat out fast, Michael Davis can still play. Anyway, um, there were three re-signings uh, when Rivera and company came. Nate Orchard at the linebacker position. Nate Angry Orchard. Um, that didn't go well. You know, I, he got signed strictly off of probably that block um, punt he had or field goal, excuse me, against the Giants. And then remember when Rivera was coaching in Carolina that game, he got fired after Nate Orchard made like the game winning sack. So that's part of the reason why he probably got re-signed. Uh, but he did a, he did nothing for us. Neither did the next guy, which was really disappointing because he was actually talented. Uh, Caleb Brantley, we got excited about him when we got him. This was a former um, first round projected draft pick that fell in the draft because of some off the field issues that he was later cleared from. But it dropped him to like a seventh round pick or he went undrafted one or the other. He might have still gone in the third round. I might be mixing up my players, but um, he he was <clears throat> projected to be a first round pick out of Florida. Had some you know issues that he got tied up in right around the draft and it, it tanked his stock. But we ended up getting our hands on him like two, three years after that. Dude's super talented and we just figured, oh yeah, we got something. COVID hit and he just said, I'm good. And, you know, when he came back, it, he never really did anything. And so he never really even played for us. Um, John Bostic was the last guy, John Boom Bostic. And we, that's another one of these bum ass linebackers that they brought on board and, and tried to convince us that the guy was playing well. And they acted as if the defense couldn't exist without John Bostic being on the field, getting everybody lined up. He was trash. Um, maybe he was a good guy in the locker room, good leader. Uh, but on the field production wise, John Bostic was astastic. So of these 2020 free agents, six of them, I noted, and maybe your number and your count is a little different than mine, but six of them, I felt like played at a, a good enough level to warrant uh, being a successful signing that free agency period. Um, those six guys are Wes Schweitzer, Kendall Fuller. Logan Thomas, J.D. McKissick, Peyton Barber, and Wes Schweitzer, okay, um, or uh, Ronald Darby. So uh, Wes Schweitzer, Kendall Fuller, Logan Thomas, J.D. McKissick, Peyton Barber, Cornelius Lucas, excuse me, and Ronald Darby. So seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, uh, Barber was good that first year, not so much the second year, um, and then he got... If I'm not mistaken, he got cut the next year. And then they signed Adrian Peterson, and then he went to the Raiders in 2021. So he was pretty much here for one year. And he did his job that one year. And then they got Adrian Peterson, so you really couldn't complain, right? Um, but in any event, was, was that Adrian Peterson? No, they cut Adrian Peterson for Peyton Barber. That's what it was. Peyton Barber showed up and a lot of people, myself included, didn't think that Peyton Barber would make the team because Adrian Peterson was here. And then they told Adrian Peterson that they were going to roll with Antonio Gibson. He got pissed off and was like, well, I don't want to be a backup. So they cut him and they kept Peyton Barber. Um, remember also in this 2020 free agency class, we were tied to Cam Newton and we wanted nothing to do with him. We were tied heavily to Cam Newton because of Ronald Rivera's background. Um, but he resisted the urge to bring his old buddy back. Um, and uh, the rest is history. So seven guys out of this group. Wes Schweitzer, Kendall Fuller, Logan Thomas, Tom, um, uh, J.D. McKissick, Peyton Barber, Cornelius Lucas, and Ronald Darby were the seven guys that I thought were solid. Now, again, solid and game-changing difference makers, et cetera, are two different things. Um, they were solid signings. 
for especially for the money for a lot of these guys. Cool beans. Now, just off the strength, just look at that list though in 2020. Name one Pro Bowl, All Pro, future Hall of Famer, any of that stuff on this list. Take your time. You find any? Because there is one. There's one Pro Bowl player on this list. One. Did you get it? Thomas Davis. By the time we got him, my grandmother could have probably made more plays than him. So that goes to show you that when we got these guys, they were journeymen Guys trying to find their way in the league, trying to survive and stay in the league. They weren't massive contributors where they had come from. They were looking for an opportunity. And we didn't have the we didn't have the the ability to say no to guys like this because we didn't we weren't a good franchise. We didn't have any talent. And we were the place you went when you were looking for an opportunity because you couldn't get it anywhere else. And that's what this free agency class represents. A far cry from where we are today, where you're getting guys with a proven track record who have played good football in this league, who have been pro bowlers, all pros, et cetera, et cetera, who have played at a very high level at times throughout their career, and we know they're capable. Now, whether we're going to get that play out of them remains to be seen. But the fact is, this list that I'm about to go over in 2024 that we've signed to this point is vastly greater than the 2020 list. Now, again, we don't know how they're going to play for the Commanders. We know how the 2020 Redskins uh, players ultimately played for the Washington football team uh, that year. So um, these are the 2024 free agents. Uh, Zach Ertz, tight end, multiple-time pro bowler with the Philadelphia Eagles. Still has football left in him. He's very comparable to Logan Thomas in terms of his movement skills. Zach Ertz was never a tremendous athlete from the standpoint of running. Uh, But he knows how to get open. And he catches the football. Something that Logan Thomas did very well also. Uh, But Ertz is a much more established player. And you feel a lot better about him than you did Logan Thomas coming in. Now, Logan Thomas turned in a career year in 2020. That year that Logan Thomas turned in is probably like the seventh best season of Zach Ertz's career, okay? Just for comparison, right? And I'm I'm being facetious a bit. That was a really good season Logan Thomas turned in. But Zach Ertz has probably had 1,000-yard seasons in his career. Or, and if not 1,000, 900 and something yard seasons and multiple ones at that. So we're talking about different level tight ends here, right? Dorrance Armstrong, defensive end. There isn't one single defensive end in free agency in 2020, which is fine because we had Montez Sweat and we had Chase, we drafted Chase Young. And so there wasn't really a need for it at that time. But um, just looking at the defenders, there isn't a single defender um, in the front seven that is young, that has the upside of a Dorrance Armstrong. Again, what he ends up doing for us remains to be seen. And we'll see if he plays at a high level here in Washington. Uh, he was around a lot of talented individuals in Dallas, and maybe that helped make him what he ultimately was. We're going to find out if he can stand on his own, go out and ball. Look, he's not going to be surrounded by bums in Washington, so he's still going to have an opportunity to be surrounded by really good players. We'll see how he uh, is able to flourish um, outside of the ecosystem that was created in Dallas. Tyler Biotish, again, um, you could compare him to um, really nobody on this list. Maybe Cornelius Lucas. Obviously, they don't play the same position. I don't want to compare him to Wes Schweitzer because I think Wes Schweitzer and Nick Allegretti are going to be the two comps, you know, in terms of the two. Uh, And we'll see how Nick Allegretti turns out for us. But he feels real Wes Schweitzer-ish to me. Uh, Whereas Tyler Biotish is going to come in here and he's going to have a chance to start. Not chance. He's going to start at center for us, we hope. And, and, And he's played good football. Very good football in his career, which netted him the three-year, $30 million deal that he's received from uh, Washington. So, um, again, another established veteran. Again, something you can't say about any of the guys um, over on the 2020 side in terms of uh, their ability to play 
uh, where Schweitzer was not a starter when we got him, uh, Tyler Biotish is. Cornelius Lucas was not a starter and wasn't one here when we got him. And when he played here, he was not a starter. So again, we didn't get a guy in free agency that looked like that. Frankie Louvu is a machine coming off of another year in which he was very successful, set a career high in tackles, um, had another six and a half sacks. Um, this is a guy that can get after the quarterback. We know that. We know he's going to flourish in Dan Quinn's system with Joe Witt Jr. And this guy's playing at a very high level, going into the prime of his career. Again, nobody, Thomas Davis wasn't going into the prime of his career. Kevin Pierre-Lewis was astastic. Again, there's nobody on the 2020 side that looks anything remotely close to Frankie Louvu in the production that he had a season ago and has been having in Carolina for the past two seasons. Austin Eckler, again, if you're comparing him to the two running backs that were in 2020, J.D. McKissick and Peyton Barber, McKissick is the closer of the two because he was a receiving threat out of the backfield. And McKissick had a really strong 2020 campaign. You put That was J.D. McKissick's best year, by the way. You put that up to Austin Eckler, and it doesn't even come close. We talked about Austin Eckler having a down season last year, right? Eckler even said it himself. That's probably J.D. McKissick's best season, and it's still probably not enough if you total up all the yardage, rushing, receiving, etc. So Austin Eckler is 10 times better than anybody watched and signed at the running back position, um, really any skill position for that matter, tight end, running back, or wide receiver. So again, uh, that's not even a conversation to be had. Uh, Washington signs a place kicker. Uh, we had a, a guy already on the roster in uh, Dustin Hopkins, so uh, obviously they didn't do anything there. So we'll see how Brandon McNannis turns out for Washington in this free agency period. Uh, Nick Allegretti, I told you, to me, he is Wes Schweitzer. He is a straight, um, to me, duplicate of Wes Schweitzer. And so he's a carbon copy in terms of what I expect, at least. Um, I'm hoping that he's better than Wes because Wes was really never truly a starter for us. I think he might've started for us in 2020 and he was pretty solid, but, um, they still saw fit to upgrade the position and Wes went to being our best and most reliable backup interior offensive lineman. I want Nick Allegretti to work out for us and solve the left guard position. That would be ideal, but, um, I'm not going to fool myself into thinking that, that's a done deal. Guy hasn't really been a starter in his career yet and only has 13 starts in four seasons. So clearly um, he was a backup for a reason. We're going to find out if he was a backup for a reason because others in front of him were really good or if he was a backup because he's not really starter material. Only one way to find out and um, we'll see if he wins the starting job. Uh, Cleveland Farrell at defensive end, as I mentioned, we had defensive ends in 2020. So they weren't looking to add guys, but he, we know what he is, right? We're just hoping he comes in here. And I'll talk more about that in a separate video. But um, what I glean from him is the leadership qualities. We'll talk more about that. I don't expect a ton of production from him, but I will say this. Somebody said that they expect Cleveland Farrell to be the starter opposite of Dorrance Armstrong because he started for San Francisco and, you know, we lose, use the term start loosely because, I mean, he might have started the game uh, opposite of Boza, but then Chase Young and all the other guys were taking the vast majority of the reps. Um, so I don't know if he'll start, but I wouldn't be shocked. That person probably is right. He might be the guy that starts opposite of Dorrance Armstrong if they don't do anything else. And I don't think they're going to do anything else at defensive end. Uh, I would like them to in the draft, but if they don't, they signed four guys, right? Three outside of the organization and then re-signing F.A. Obata. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if they didn't do anything. Uh, quarterback Marcus Mariota, um, much more storied career than Kyle Allen. Now, I, I, you know, what's crazy is there's a lot of Marcus Mariota hate. And He's a backup quarterback. A lot of people are treating him like we brought him in here to start or something. Like, this guy shouldn't see the field if everything goes according to plan. He won't even touch the grass on Sunday 
when it matters. Well, why is there so much hate for Marcus? And if he does have to, as long as it's in a, as I've already said, a very concentrated form where we're talking about one or two games max, we're fine. Marcus Mariota is fine. Like, I, I just don't understand the disdain for Marcus Mariota. He's better than Kyle Allen, I'll tell you that much. Um, Dante Fowler Jr. Uh, and Marcus Mariota took his team to the playoffs, won a playoff game, just in case people forgot. Anyway, Dante Fowler Jr., uh, another really solid defensive end who has played under Dan Quinn everywhere he's been. So, I, again, I like my Dante Fowler Jr. off the bench in limited snaps. That's when he's at his best, when he comes in, big ball of energy, explosive and dynamic, and hopefully we'll be utilizing him in that same capacity here. Noah Igbenogany is a you know solid depth piece at corner. Um I don't expect him to play very much on defense. Expect him to be more of a core special teamer, guy that is a gunner, getting down on punts and kickoffs and things of that nature. Uh, but we'll see what his role ultimately ends up being if he, in fact, makes this roster, which I don't expect him. Um, I expect him to be on the roster. Jeremy Chen, uh, safety, is a very intriguing piece. Sean Davis is the safety they signed in 2020. That's not even a conversation. Jeremy Chen uh, was the runner up um, in his rookie season for defensive uh, rookie of the year. And if not for Chase Young, and some argue that Chen might have had a better season statistically, but if not for Chase Young, he would have won that award. And he had some really big seasons early in his career. The first two years, really big seasons for the Carolina Panthers. The last two, not so much. Injuries really hampered him in year three. In year four, he fell out of, of favor in Carolina with their new defensive coordinator. And so here he is, guy super talented. I think he's a great fit for this Dan Quinn, Joe Witt Jr. scheme. And um, I think he's going to do big things. And I'm hoping that he kills it to the point where he's back next year on a multi-year deal and uh, continues to play here in Washington. But he's got to do it first under this one-year contract that he signed. Linebacker Anthony Pittman um, is probably more comparable to Kevin Pierre-Lewis when we got him, which was a core special teamer that we tried to turn into a starting backer. Um, But Anthony Pittman serves a purpose. We know what his role is. He knows what his role is, and he's going to do it well. That's what has gotten him to this point, and that's what he's going to continue to do is play special teams. So um, nothing wrong with that signing. You need guys like that on your roster. Then you get to Bobby Wagner. Again, uh, similar to what I said about Austin Eckler and even Zach Ertz, but more particularly for Bobby Wagner, they're in a single a single soul on the 2020 side that has the resume of a Bobby Wagner. There isn't one future Hall of Famer on that 2020 side. And unlike Thomas Davis, who is the closest thing you're going to get to Bobby Wagner um, from 2020, He's still playing at a high level as Bobby Wagner. He just set a career high for himself and led the NFL in tackles a season ago. Is he the same Bobby Wagner in coverage? Can he run as good as he used to? No. But is he still damn good and playing at a very high level? You damn right. And so it it isn't even close when you're talking about Bobby Wagner. There's still a lot of good football left in there. And he's he's way better than anybody on the 2020 side. By miles, okay? Michael Davis, I liken him to Ronald Darby. We've talked about this already. Um, You know, one-year deal, come in, prove it, you know, and and show what you can do. I think that's what he's going to do. Uh, This is a good football player. I've watched him play at a high level. I've watched him have some down seasons before. Um, I think last year was more of a byproduct of coaching. I thought that um, their coach struggled last year, man. I mean, you know, Brandon um, um, Staley was, whew, we thought Ronald was bad. Brandon Staley was struggling last year, man, with everything. Uh, and he's supposed to be a defensive guy, and he was struggling with the simplest of things last season. So I think that really attributed to Michael Davis's struggles last season. But um, in 2022, lights out, and I think he can get back to that. And then... Uh, long snapper Tyler Ott, you know, obviously we had our struggles with long snappers last year. Um, so enter in Tyler Ott to clean up the position and hopefully be here for the next 
you know, three or four years and, and keep that position nice and quiet. And then re-signings, uh, Jeremy Reeves at safety, uh, F.A. Obata at defensive end, and Jamison Crowder at receiver, better than any of the three re-signings from the 2020 campaign. Um, and this isn't, you know, recency biased. None of those guys did anything to impact the team in a positive manner. Orchard and Brantley don't, I don't even think they even made the team. Um, if Orchard made the team, he didn't do a damn thing. Meanwhile, John Bostic was awful. He hurt us more than he helped us. He did get that pick, though, in the Steelers game when we defeated the undefeated Pittsburgh Steelers in 2020. He did get that pick, but it's not like he made a play. You know, Montez Sweat tipped the ball in the air, and he just was Johnny on the spot, right? But um, Reeves, F.A., and Crowder all um, serve a purpose. All have played well in the past for the Commanders, and we feel really good about these guys moving forward. So I don't even know how we could be saying that this is comparable. Um, the guys that we signed here, and look, I'm not telling you that they're world beaters, okay, from 2024. I'm not telling you that this is a group of guys that are going to turn this team around into an 11-win team like some of you may think. But this is a much better group than the 2020 group. I mean, again, if you look at the 2020 list, most of those guys were not starters before they got to Washington. Think about that for a second. The only guy that was a pseudo starter, probably from where he came from, was Kendall Fuller. But you look at the rest of these names, nobody started. Ronald Darby had some starts in his career, but he had dealt with injuries and, and he had fallen on hard times, which is how he ended up in Washington on a one-year deal in the first place. But look at this list. Most of these guys were trying to fight for survival in their NFL careers when they came here, other than Kendall Fuller and Wes Schweitzer, who, who had already established himself as a very solid interior backup offensive lineman. But again, he was a backup. None of these guys were starters. Thomas Davis was done. His career was cooked by the time he got here. And you're looking at our list, and these are guys who have all been starters. These are all starting players. Zach Ertz, starter. Dorrance Armstrong was a starter. And if he didn't start, he played a lot of snaps for the Dallas Cowboys and was one of their more impactful starters or, or players along that defensive line. Tyler Biotish, starter. Frankie Louvu, starter. Austin Eckler, starter. You know, um, you look at um, Jeremy Chin was a starter. Now, he's looking to try to get back on track. Bobby Wagner, starter. Michael Davis, starter. Tyler Ott, starter, right? If you want to get technical, Brandon McMahon is starter. He's a kicker, though. Let's not get too crazy, right? Same with Tyler Ott, but you get my drift. There, and Of course, uh, when you sign guys to one-year deals and you, you turn over the roster, you're going to have guys that you know are looking for an opportunity. Um, and so Cleveland Farrell looking for an opportunity. Nick Allegretti looking for an opportunity. Marcus Mario, he's a backup quarterback. I mean, it is what it is. You, you sign one of those, you know what you're getting. Um, Dante Fowler Jr., you know, depth, right? Uh, Noah Igbenogany, you know, uh, special teams guy. Anthony Pittman, same thing. But most of these guys have starting experience. Even Cleveland Farrell has starting experience in his career. This is a former top, you know, seven NFL draft pick we're talking about here. So uh, this list is vastly different. I don't know how anybody could say that it's very similar um, the names on the 2024 list, on paper at least, are way better. They dwarf the list from 2020. That's asinine to me. Now we'll see uh, what it produces on the field. And I'll take it a step further. The coaching staff is greater in 2024. And we, don't, we haven't even seen them yet, and we know it's better than the, the trash that we had out there in 2020. So um, I said all of that to say this. There's no way that you can compare the two crops of free agents and feel like they're similar, right? They're equals. One is superior to the other, all right? Chef P cooked in 2024, Ron Rivera guessed in 2020. That's what it amounts to. He guessed in 2020. He got some right, 
He got a lot of them wrong, and, and he continued to get them wrong from that point forward. And, and you could argue that uh, the ones that he did get right were because of the guy that was here helping him that he got rid of the next year. And that's part of the reason why they were never really successful in free agency moving forward is because he moved on from the one guy that probably could have helped him in that department. You guys know who I'm talking about. I can't think of his name, but he's in Atlanta. Anyway, um, what says you? Is it comparable? Do you see similarities between the 2020 and 2024 free agency crops? Look, at the end of the day, we didn't spend a lot in 2020 and we haven't spent a lot in 2024, but that doesn't change the fact that I think we got better value in 2024 and you got more effective players and you got more bang for your buck in 2024, or at least I feel like we're going to get it. Again, we know what happened in 2020, and so we have the advantage of being able to see what happened and look back on that, and uh, we don't have that data for 2024 yet. We can only project. But if we, if we project what those guys have been in their careers to what those guys in 2020 were coming into Washington, it's not even close. It's not even close. So nobody walked away from the 2020 class saying, I think we got a chance to win double-digit games. I don't think anybody should be saying that about the 2024 class either. I'm not, but there are people saying that. I can tell you this. I didn't walk away from the 2020 crop of free agents saying, they're going to give us a chance to compete on defense, and they're going to keep us in ball games. I never said that. I'm already saying that about the 2024 crop. But anyway, I digress. Leave it down in the comment section. What do you think? Compare and contrast 2020 to 2024 free agency class. Is it close? Am I tripping? Is it similar? Is it more similar than I'm giving it credit for? You tell me. Leave it down in the comment section. But um, that's going to do it for me, your man Louis T, here on this installment of the Command Post. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I'll see you guys next time. Have a good one. Louis T. Network.